Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined by Terry Robinson, and today we've decided we've been going easy on you lately. Things have been a little light and fluffy here on Tomes of Magic, so today we are going to deal with evil, insanity, demon worship, and unknowable frightful beings from alternate dimensions. Yes, we are going to be talking about the Book of Madness Revised. And so in the midst of all this, I really need a warm, reassuring voice next to me. Terry Robinson, thanks for taking this journey with me. I'm here for you, Adam. When you said, like, we were going to take a journey through madness, through insanity, through the strongest feelings that could be generated in gaming, I was waiting for you to be like, ah, we're going to talk about GURPS, and then about the differences between the additions in Vampire the Masquerade. Excellent. <laughs> um... <laughs> Terry wanted everyone to know that he's not actually a subject matter expert on twisted depravity. And as for me, uh, no comment. There, there is a certain toolbox that one gets as a property casualty reinsurance actuary, but usually it's, it's, it's pretty mixed in with mirth. Like we'll get a claims listing and one of my favorite entries is still the one that said student angered at poor class grade stole truck full of French fries. Um, and <laughs> another one was two small but well-meaning children burned down church. <laughs> um, I'm glad they included the well-meaning part. It's one of those things where you always have like 80 characters. I don't know if you've ever had to fill out like a feedback form or like you've had to submit an RMA for a broken product and they're like, tell us what the problem is with the device. And you're like, oh man, I've got my paragraphs of the problems and like it's limited to 255 characters. So you basically have to tweet at them. So they'll be like, right button broke when push on button. And then the other person at the other end just thinks you're an idiot because they don't realize that you're dealing with this limitation. <laughs> well, today we are covering the Book of Madness Revised. This is the second Book of Madness that we have for Mage. The first was during first edition. And uh, just to make things more convenient for all those Mage fans out there, the second Book of Madness has an identical title. Uh, clock's in at 148 pages. We're still in the publishing year 2001. This book had six authors all working together to make this project happen. And I, for one, am ready for a walkthrough. The opening of this book is a chapter called The Prelude, entitled Evading Hell, where we get one of the things that Revised does, where it gives you a vague hint of all the other things happening across the world of darkness and maybe across mage where it gives you a quick little reminder of all the things that have happened in the previous book where it makes mention of a cabal here or a group there uh, and it is somebody by the name of mark talking to what he thinks is leanne but it turns out not to be leanne and when it is revealed that it's not leanne he calls leanne and goes leanne yeah you know the person i was talking to that wasn't leanne yeah, she totally fell for it. And I'm like, what the dink is this? So they are setting up something, and I really hope there's a payoff for it. I like the fact that it's like the early 2000s, and cell phones are coming around, and you have techno mages. Everyone has access to correspondence. And then later on the, in this book, it's like, oh, man, if you want to include spirits in your game, you should totally use them as messengers. But every get-together in mage that is of importance is either taking place at a run-down mansion or on the side of a cliff. Like, I don't know if those the day rates for those things are cheaper or what, but it seems whenever important information is being delivered in Mage. The Book of Madness starts, we get the introduction, it tells us what's inside, and we get a second edition-esque reminder at the end that says, Hey, stupid, don't do this stuff. And it gets pretty explicit pretty fast. And on one end of the spectrum, I'm like, this is stupid. Do you really need to remind people? And then on the other end of the spectrum, I'm like, thank goodness they remind people. Oh, when I hit that disclaimer, I was kind of not expecting that. I had to find some boxes of stuff in my garage and kind of get rid of those. But I'm okay now. <laughs> I'm, on the, I'm, on, I'm doing good. Chapter one of this book is entitled Nefandi. And in case you weren't sure, this chapter is about the Nefandi. And the opening fiction is about two mages who have started a fake church. And it was kind of interesting and sets up a frame. This book, to me, really marked the reintroduction of useless in world fiction, where it was like, let's spend a half page and not really add anything. It quickly goes through ranks. It quickly goes through what they are. But one of the things it does, and I appreciate this, is Revised was good at finally figuring out what the group's were. One of the things it brings up is all Nefandi are people who realized that they are doing evil, came to the conclusion they were doing evil, and then kept going. That is ultimately represented 
as a trip through the call, which is a opening to a metaphysical other place that allows them to commune with some sort of dark lord, which ultimately results in the inversion of their avatar. They are the representation of the primordial break everything down aspect of the metaphysical trinity. It doesn't dwell too much on history and it gets right into the ranks where it says, hey, this group is made of unawakened pawns who may not be entirely sure what they're up to, who are doing it for personal benefit. They're awakened pawns who have an idea of usually what's going on. In a lot of cases, people who are in this group don't think it applies to them, which is to say one of the things that, one of the key tools that the Nefandi are very good at using against their enemies is their enemy's arrogance. It then breaks down the lower levels into two groups, the Shaitans, who are the what they refer to as the fallen version of a SWAT team, who are the killing side of the Nefandi, versus the Sinistrati, who are the recruit mint and i guess you could say more paper pushers of the uh, of darkness as it were like the accountants of satan above that you have the prolati which tend to be the eyes and ears of the gelidians and then it says the gelidians who are these paranoid very rarely seen entities that work indirectly and that they tend to run a labyrinth which is the nefandi version of a chantry above that you have the ashwadim who are teachers and sages this is a change from previous edition where the ashwadim were oracles were essentially either archmasters or very powerful entities here it indicates that occasionally a very promising student will be tapped on the shoulder by one of these dark bodhisattva and be taught things these two definitions aren't strictly competing but i thought that to me felt like a a shift in how they were defining it. We get a little information on the three general factions, which we're going to come back to. And then it talks about the Nefandi mission. All Nefandi in some way want to end everything. They generally don't trade directly in souls like the Infernalists do. They engage in the game of destroying everything, whether that be polluting a community or degradating social ideals or bringing down individual people or destroying social structures. And some are just kind of sadists. In previous editions, demons generally wanted sleepers and Nefandi hunted mages. Uh, now the Nefandi want both. Being able to corrupt a mage is considered a, a great boon or show of ability, but the, they're perfectly fine creating mortal cultists, which they go into in a little bit of detail. They gain status from this as a Barabbas, and they've recently got more competitive. They kind of suggest that one of the recurring themes in this, in this book is upping of the politics in mage that i guess if you're going to have a game that runs more on the earthly side or is more centered around people rather than having most of your antagonists be these external outsider things attempting to consume reality they want to have some sort of intra-group strife or competition and we get the idea that the nefandi their labyrinths are this combination of deadly politics plus fashion show plus social scene plus support group plus magical tutoring they make mention that all of them are serving some sort of higher entity this is a something that is deviated from in m20 and then it gives a little bit of information on kind of what those entities want that generally the more powerful they are the more specific they are which okay fine uh, that doesn't quite always make sense to me and it gives you a list of tactics that we get that the Fondi apply to try and get what they want. And this section I thought was was kind of interesting, where it goes over fear, where they instill fear by invading personal space and then offering to leave the person alone in exchange for that other person's service. So your cabal is being harassed by a Nefandus, and the Nefandus says, hey, I will leave you alone if you can find this book for me. And now the characters are in the position of having to figure out, do we want to do this or do we want to have to deal with this Nefandus even more? They may take hostages where they trade safety safety instead for the service of another person. They may go for seduction, and that could be in the traditional sense, uh, or it could just be the seduction of money or magic or something. They talk about trying to isolate mages and then become their friends and helping to deal with those who have been isolated or otherwise lost their community. It was odd that this wasn't in the storytelling chapter, but sure. They make mention of the cults that are of Nefandi and by Nefandi, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> and talk about how they differ, the fact that they sent up front organizations to try and bring in un unwitting sleepers. We get some information on what their labyrinths look like, which is to say their chantries. Some are in abandoned places, some are in the, the center of the areas that they are trying to corrupt. All of them have a litany, which is a list of rituals, rites, and such that each labyrinth practices. They tend to be similar across labyrinths, but aren't 
quite the same. And then we get a little bit more information on the clopothic spheres that the magic of the Nefandi are entirely based on destruction. They tend to be more paradox prone. We don't get any rules on this. And their flaws that are generated from this paradox are often some sort of inhuman uh, twisting to their form. I think one of my favorite ones was from, I think, the previous Book of Madness, where there was a character that had seven fingers on one hand and three on the other. Uh, their spheres are generally, and their magic is generally about negation, that corresponds destroys space, and life is a mockery of healing and cancerous, and forces tend to be uh, cold and still. They were evocative, but as with most of Revised, the discussion of magic was very uh, sphere-focused. The other thing was, since this is revised, they emphasize the importance of resonance, that everything they do has this dark nefondic resonance to it, which I had a problem with because that suggests that finding nefondi should be really easy by tracking down this kind of dark entropic resonance. It later makes mention that the smart nefondi know how to conceal it, but I, I, it felt to me like revised very quickly becomes this game of doing, a six, doing an effect and then doing the math of whether or not you want to go through the time of suppressing the resonance from it. It goes into more details about their labyrinths and it talks about uh, the, the differences between the groups and how they tend to uh, leave their footprint in the world. And then finally, it talks about calls, that they are these rent in space somewhere located deep in a labyrinth that is a connection to wherever their dark lord is. And it gives options on how players can interface with that. Um, and I thought it was interesting that they, uh, that they made mention that, uh, some groups are very good neighbors and I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that's, I'm glad that's in there. It, it suggests that a lot of the Nefandi left in 45. So once the, when Mage Continuity refers to the barring of the Nefandi, to me, that was always the barring of the Dark Lords, like preventing Cthulhu or yogg sothoth or, um, like Malator, greater God of pain from entering. But it suggests that no, a lot of their minions either packed up and left or were also in some way banned. And one of the things Revised does is, hey, there's some cool stuff that people have left over that you can go out and find. And I don't know what sounds like fun to you, but raiding an old Nefondic labyrinth for information or for magic, what could possibly go wrong? It also talks about how many labyrinths tend to have shallowings nearby, which are natural holes in the gauntlet. And in Revised, shallowings are quite powerful because they allow you to not have to deal with the Avatar Storm. They also make mention of Niles, which are a wraith thing. Thank you, Richard Densky. They talk about a little bit of the Nefondi cosmology and how it stands in the early 20th century, that some Nefondi are coming back, which doesn't make sense because if you have the Avatar Storm raging, why would they be coming back now? Uh, it talks again about the idea that much of the power of many Nefondi come from the dreams of the Malfians, who are these entities sleeping in the low umbra, that if they wake up, the Nefandi will lose their power, but also makes mention of the fact, hey, if this is just their dreams, what can an awake Malfian actually do? And it makes mention that these Malfians are slowly crawling towards wakefulness. This chapter is a big collection of things. And before we get started on, on, on our thoughts about it, this group had factions. And why I th think factions, I think Adam. Adam, what are the factions within the Nefandi? Well, we've got three main factions and one specific group. We start off with the, I'm going to say Kalasha. Uh, the spelling uh, allows the pronunciation to be open for interpretation. But uh, the Kalasha are <laughs> unstable and insane servants of beings beyond the horizon, uh, deep umbra sort of uh, frightening unknown beings. These are the least numerous. They rarely work in groups larger than three and are often solitary. The first Book of Madness had a Nefondi faction called the Outsiders, and the Kalasha were one group in that faction. This book has the Kalasha as the only Outsiders. Next up are the Malfians, servants of manifestations of corruption and destruction. They get their name from the beings of Malpheus, the realm of the worm from Werewolf the Apocalypse. New members walk the Black Spiral Labyrinth instead of going through the calls. They are the Nefandi most likely to have monstrous servants. We have the Infernalists, servants of demons and devils of various real-world religions. Uh, they are the most understandable to regular people. They recruit the most new members but have the most infighting. And last, we have one specific group or society that has formed on Earth called the Benevolent Society of Lost Souls. This is a cross-faction gathering of Nefandi and even some Sabbat vampires who are specialists in kidnapping and torture. They affect old world British mannerisms until it's time for action. And those are the groups of the Nefandi. So I guess, uh, Terry, what, what are your uh, thoughts on this chapter? 
This chapter had a lot going on. It, some of the storyteller advice was interesting when it's like, hey, some of the signs of nephondic activity is that they tend to use mortals to ferret out awakened activity and that they stir fighting between the traditions and the technocracy and cause a turf war with other supernaturals and they like invading people's dreams. They kind of introduce a lot of things in the book to have as red herrings. And one of the things I found over time as a storyteller is like, you don't need to add red herrings players will generally make their own. <laughs> um, and unless you want to like move the goalpost to be like, oh, it turned out what you needed was in, in front of the door you were going to open anyway. What are the odds? Or something like that. I tend not to like those unless you can heavily signpost what's actually going on because you can lose a lot of time if the group is barking up the wrong tree. And if it's something you set up and it's something the players are following through, that can kind of be frustrating for everyone. So again, your mileage may vary. Know your group. It, it makes it sound like the Nefandi are converting people all the time and that there's a lot of them. Like if these labyrinths are kind of these hubs of dark politics, but most of them are destroyed and every city also has one, that implies that every city previously may have had several and it just kind of breaks immersion to me because it's suggested and revised that the Nefandi are a lot subtler and this book is like, oh no, they're still there. Like I, I wish I had gotten more information on what had changed there the feeling i got was there are more nefandi but they are generally less effective like one of the things that the previous editions gave to me was the idea that like you could tell someone was a bad guy in the world of darkness because they could cooperate uh the nefandi got along well with other nefandi and they could coordinate and maybe at the top they kind of disagreed and the technocracy is kind of the apex of it and the parts didn't quite fit together where they're like ah nefandi only inhabit areas that are dark and and dedicated towards a particular dark act and then you're like also they tend to be in cities but they like secluded areas i'm like wait how do you have one that's all all three and sometimes they're like they can be miles large i'm like how are you fitting that in a city so it just didn't quite go together for me it was an interesting grab bag like i liked a little more detail about the calls and some of the plot ideas but on the whole it just i don't want to say it felt lazy but this it, i didn't feel like this added a lot for me what did you think i had to say i had the same opinion i thought the uh first book of madness did an interesting job of introducing uh, nefandi and what we can do with them and this yeah, just there was less there for me. I think they made the mistake of saying, now that we are writing material that focuses on the Nefandi, let's make them look more numerous and more of an immediate threat, and let's get all excited about the Nefandi. And I think they should have paid more attention to previous revised edition Nefandi material and say, look, they're their lords have been mostly shut down. There's less of them. They're less active. They're, this revised edition has less of a focus on the threat of the Nefandi than the previous two editions. And so it would have been nice to, to carry that into this chapter and instead of just saying, oh, we're talking about Nefandi now? Yeah, they're real bad. They're so bad. They're just awful and they're everywhere. And it's like, uh, I thought it was interesting. They note that there are 13 Giletians in the world today. The uh, Giletian is the, the high, highest ranking Nefandi, they uh, generally control and operate uh, labyrinths of their own and uh, tell most other Nefandi what to do. So I, I immediately thought, oh, and there's 13 vampire clans. Coincidence? But of course, that's, uh, that's kind of reaching there. Entirely. But... <laughs> yeah, but I just thought it was interesting that they put a number on it. It's like, okay, storytellers, this is how many Gelettians you're supposed to have. It's like, I thought it was uh, interesting to look at, the, I guess it's supposed to be pronounced Klepothic. I always pronounce it Klepothic, but inverted dark magic that has been kind of associated with the Nefandi ever since first edition. In first edition, there was Klepothic entropy sphere, but only that. And so it made me think, oh, there, there's something about the entropy sphere that allows a, a practitioner to get in touch with uh, you know, primal destructive forces. And so that, that, that's kind of interesting. It's, it makes it a little unique among the spheres. In this book, they say every sphere has a Klepothic version of it. And so, okay, well, that's that's a, dif a different outlook on it. And of course, uh, Mage 20th edition says that there are no Klepothic spheres. It's just the Nefandi use the regular spheres. They just do evil things when they use the regular spheres. And in this book, they have a paragraph or two for each Klepothic sphere to sort of give you some flavor or some feel of how it might be a little different. But really, it's, it's just suggesting a different style. I don't think it justifies an intrinsically different or inverted sphere. As a storyteller, I read through this and it's like, no, this is this is not what I need to portray Klepothic spheres in my game. Uh, it, it's 
seems to suggest more why Mage 20 just said, yeah, they have regular spheres, but they do awful things with them. There was so much talk of Nefandi looking for isolated mages and really wanting to hit them. It just seems natural that they would go looking for orphans, for, you know, orphan with a capital O, the orphan mages. And there, there was no particular mention of that. It's like, it seems like you, you should have talked about that with all this mention of hitting isolated mages or wanting to isolate mages and then, you know, uh, influencing them. We had a whole book, Dead Magic, saying that mages, uh, now that magic is harder and, and the uh, paradigms have changed a bit, consensual reality is working a little differently these days in revised editions. So there are a lot of mages are going out and looking for old magic, old magic tomes, old wonders, forgotten magical groups that aren't even around anymore but might have left behind some writings. And it seems like the Nefandi would be an interesting group to go investigate. It's like, hey, have they got some magic that uh, you know we've been ignoring for, for a few hundred years? And there wasn't much mention of that. It just seemed like such an opportunity after Revised Edition put out Dead Magic to kind of dig into that. And this book chose not to go that path. And yeah, basically, the first edition Book of Madness gives us 27 pages on the Nefandi. And there were wonders, there were NPCs, there were you know specific societies or groups and it kind of got me interested, and this book had 37 pages on the Nefandi, but no wonders, no NPCs, one specific society. In your comment on the Gelidians, it's weird because they're like, in one section it says only one in a hundred Nefandi have ever seen one, and in another section, like, they rule over the labyrinth court and tend to be brought in as well to oversee trials. And such, and I'm like, that doesn't seem like. Yeah, that's a real inconsistency. Would... There were a number of inconsistencies like that. Uh, in the previous two editions, the labyrinth, the Nefandi only chantry, was something that existed in Horizon Realms. So they could be big, they could be scary, they could be weird, and, and all this kind of stuff. And in revised edition, the mages are operating on Earth. And this book didn't really address that. It's like, okay, are most of the labyrinths in Horizon Realms and only Nefandi know how to get to them? Or are they on Earth? In which case, this book says some of them are miles big. It's like, yeah, that's not working. I don't I don't care if it's a rural. That, that's not working. Yep. So chapter two is entitled Marauders and brings us a, I'm not going to say entirely new vision of what the Marauders are, but a, uh, a solid interpretation of what they are, how they work, how they fit, and more importantly to me, mechanics. They're noted for their ability to warp reality, and it took me a little bit to get on board with what this reality warping is, but um, I think they ultimately do uh, a good job of explaining it, where they say that marauders in some way have broken, and they are now almost always actively using their magic to in some way change the world around them. And there are three statistics that you need to keep in mind when figuring out how a marauder changes the world around them. They have a quiet rating, which indicates the level of deviance between them and reality. A quiet rating of one might be something like all dollar bills in the United States are blue or the president is a different person. A quiet rating of two may be some dead family members of yours are still alive to a quiet rating of five, which is just kind of off the deep end where you're like, all humans are actually sentient dinosaurs and we are ruled in a society like governed by space apes or something like that and even more remote than that. So the quiet tells you the level of deviance from quote unquote real reality. Arite and spheres determine the changes that a marauder is able to make. This limits whether or not they can cause people to be sentient dinosaurs and such, or uh, what entities they're able to summon into their reality. And resonance determines the strength of the reality warp. So at a low level of resonance in an area close to them, there will be some subtle changes that someone who has awareness or a attentive mage would be able to notice where at high levels it is a lot of change and it exudes strongly from the marauder so fitting with the revised concern of resonance is a thing the mechanics for marauders tend to bang on about it we get some information about some possible theories that they are counterpoints to paradox spirits or that they have stolen their powers from paradox spirits or a are possessed by rogue paradox spirits. It goes into some information on how their paradox immunity works, that it's tied to whatever their quiet rating is, and when they generate paradox, it tends to bleed off to the nearest person. 
and then it goes quickly into themes and how to use them that marauders need to fit a need in your chronicle that they could be flashy or they could be antagonistic and it represents two different sets of rules for that which i liked whereas in one case it's like hey if you want something that is rich uh, richly mechanical here's some recommendations on how to do that here's how it interacts with other mages the other way is something much more loose to fit whatever you, the needs you have of your story how a marauder in a particularly deep set of quiet will eventually be pushed out of reality and that they they follow different paradox rules it gives us a number of groups and a number of example characters and uh, I liked a bunch of the example characters that they gave us uh, Robert Davenport is introduced again who is a brilliant researcher who the technocracy wanted to eliminate awakens in the moment in which his car is hit and his family dies and his uh, quiet stems from the fact that he believes his wife is still alive he is one of the leaders of the umbral underground is listed as sane enough to almost know what he is and to me robert davenport is probably one of the most sympathetic characters in all of mage i, I think he, he's particularly compelling his story him attempting to help the, the the people around him and to make sense of what's happening i i kind of enjoy as an idea we also get jeffrey the general of heaven the leader of the citrine thinks he has god on his side and receives direct messages from the metatron has in in m20 parlance i would say he has a denial or a clarity rating more so than a quiet rating where he just ignores the aspects of the world that are outside of his plan and again this i think is another compelling case for the marauders what struck me though is within the marauder section it gives a pretty nuanced consideration of what a marauder is how they can interact in your chronicle what they can do and in the rest of the book though they're like marauders they're just nuts and i'm like really like this is the this is the tack we're going to take on that like they they're used to portray mental illness i'm like they can be used to portray a lot more than that even if you don't want that to be the central theme of things and that was kind of a feeling i, I left stepping away from that but we also get some groups of the mar marauders what are they adam well in the uh, first book of darkness we had the umbral underground and the by die which was supposed to be a, a dangerously unstable murderous group of marauders that uh, don't work together that well uh, here, the Umbral Underground has changed its name to The Underground. They are now confused with countless restaurants and bars. They no longer attack technocrat strongholds directly, preferring to draw technocrats away from their constructs and then attacking them. The Underground uh, now has much less use of bygones than they did in the past. Cabals include the following. We have the Butcher Street Regulars, the Cabal of Robert Davenport, uh, who Terry mentioned, uh, the leader of the Umbral Underground. Uh, this cabal is made up of low, quiet marauders who recruit for the underground. They move around and are considered highly dangerous. The men of Gotham operate in northeastern U.S. cities as crime-fighting vigilantes. A little comic book humor there. Uh, the Knights of St. Stephen are a large group found in the U.S., Europe, and Australia. They play the roles of knights and similar characters from medieval and renaissance periods. They often show up at live-action RPG offense and rend fairs. I get a little bit of humor injected in there as well. The, the Bai Dai has fallen apart as an organization, but a splinter group called the Kayoth Ha Kadesh is now active. They were organized by a militant occult apocalyptic group called the Citrin, and the Avatar Storm has removed many powerful marauders, making the Citrin's efforts easier. The Kayoth Ha Kadesh now strike against Nefandi in large gatherings of sleepers. They are heavily armed with modern weapons. There are two specific groups inside the Kayoth. Hakadesh. There's the Pochun, uh, which means Broken Star Army, a large group of bandits operating in China, and they are manipulated by the Citroen. They strike against other warlords trying to return the Middle Kingdom, which is China, to its former glory. We also have Team 23, a mostly high-tech and violent group uh, manipulated again by the Citroen. Their technomagic appears as energy rifles, force fields, and cybernetics. They make sure all humans are killed off before disappearing through warp gates. And that is really it for our Marauder groups. A little bit of uh, humor injected there by the uh, White Wolf authors. I feel like humor should kind of be in air quotes for some of them. Like in the Nefandi section, there's the whole thing on books from the abyss, which to me just felt like an extended joke on RPGs. You read a book and it's not that good, but you're compelled to read it. And then you have to get another one. And I'm like, hey, buddy, um, I... <laughs> I, I'm on to you, or at least that's how I interpreted it, because revised on the whole seems to be much more self-aware about those things. One of the nice things about this version of the Marauders is we get mechanics. It talks about how they change the world as they move through it and what a mage is going to see. 
how a marauder is going to move through the world, how others will be able to see their view of the world, which can be more or less concerning. And it gives things like recommendations on spheres, as well as a few merits and flaws, of which I think by far the uh, the most menacing was the one where you have a flaw where when people enter your reality bubble, they realize what's going on, which seems like it would be a special kind of terrifying. Overall, I just want to start off by saying this is, in in my opinion, the best Marauder material we have seen so far in a mage book since the beginning of Mage. There were two points in the past where they treated with uh, Marauders. Once was the first Book of Madness, and then there was the Book of Mirrors, I believe, had a section on Marauders, and that was second edition. This, I think, is the best uh, Marauder material we've seen so far. So if I'm picking up mage books and it's like, look, I, I need to uh, get some info on Marauders, kind of get my thoughts together and get a sense of direction for this uh, game session I'm going to run, I'm going to go to Book of Madness Revised because it's, it's giving me the best material, the best ideas, the best everything. And even though there was a, a, you know some humor in here, some of which was kind of clever, some of which was not as clever, but less so than previous uh, published material on Marauders. I, I think if you go to the first Book of Madness, I think the, the humor there is more prevalent and uh, less useful to me as a storyteller. First off, I, I don't allow Marauder player characters in any games that I run. They did have material in here and even suggested outright, hey, you could have Marauder player characters and here's some rules to help make that work. And I, I guess it's nice for people who want to do that, but that's not something that I ever want to do. So that was not as useful for me. But I like how they mention that uh, Marauder NPCs can bend the rules of the, the mage game and different Marauders can bend the rules in different ways. I think some people are going to say, well, obviously the Marauders. And yeah, okay, there's something to that. But I think it is helpful for new storytellers to read through this and say, oh, okay, if, if I want to do something weird and way out with Marauders, it's okay for this one Marauder to ignore this rule or that rule from the game book and just, just to make the narrative scene compelling to my players. Like, yeah, you can do that, and it actually kind of fits for Marauders. I, I agree with that. So I think that's a useful thing for storytellers to have there. What I really liked about this chapter was it clearly explained the idea of uh, what Terry called uh, reality bubble. I, I call them mad visions. Uh, you'll have a marauder who believes he's on an alien planet where everything is very strange and different. And as that marauder walks around the city, sleepers and even other mages who are you know, in close proximity to him will get pulled into his reality bubble. And they'll, all of a sudden there will be a, like a blink and they'll look around and say, hey, this is not downtown San Francisco. Where am I? What is going on here? Why am I dressed different? This is really, really strange. And this was alluded to in fiction pieces in the first two editions of editions of mage but here it is really spelled out clearly and made very accessible and i think useful for storytellers and i think that is a great way to use marauders now it explains not all marauders do this but plenty of them do and i think there are a number of new storytellers out there who are looking at marauders and like okay they're mages only they're crazy and everybody thinks they're dangerous what, what can i really do with a marauder in in my game session tonight to let everybody know that marauders look unique and 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 this is it, the reality bubbles. The, the marauder shows up, sleepers get pulled into that reality bubble, and they don't realize what's happening. It actually gives us a concrete example. There's a regular sleeper who wakes up in his regular modern uh, downtown apartment, and he goes out jogging. And all of a sudden, he's standing in King Arthur's court, and he's dressed as a page, and he's running a message from one lord to another. And he is thinking in his mind, yeah, I'm a page. I'm running from this lord's tent to the other lord's tent during this jousting tournament. And then as the jogger moves away from the marauder, gets far enough away, he's once again a regular jogger in a, a regular downtown city park. And then he goes home, and he doesn't even know what happened that day. So sleepers don't know when they're getting pulled into the reality bubbles, but it happens. Now for mages, they're awakened, and so appropriately, when they get pulled into a reality bubble, they, they can see, hey, I suddenly dress differently, I, I know what's happened, maybe there's a marauder around here, I was told about that when I was an apprentice. And so this makes it so that the player characters, who are usually mages, of course, when you're running a mage game, they're not getting forced into playing a funny character in a funny scene. It's like they know what's going on, but the sleepers around them don't. And so it just, even though this was alluded to in previous editions of Mage Now, it is very clearly explained. We have examples, we have rules for it. it it's clearly spelled out. And I think that is a very good tool for storytellers to make Marauders unique and 
easily understand how to use them when they are running game sessions. So yeah, big thumbs up for that. Uh, very, very nice material. I like how they have some rules mechanics for when a mage gets pulled into a Marauder's reality bubble, how can they deal with it? Well, it's an Arate roll. If you've got a mid-level mage and a mid-level Marauder, they're roughly the same in power, then they both have an Arate roll. If the Marauder wins then their reality takes place. All of a sudden, everything turns into an alien planet and the sleepers get pulled into it. Now, if your regular sane mage wins the Arate roll, then the reality bubble of the Marauder gets shut down. And the Marauder is suddenly standing in you know downtown regular city and, and the Marauder might be surprised and kind of caught off guard. And that's your player's chance to get the upper hand quickly. And so this is a useful, reasonable game mechanic that I want to use in my games. It makes sense, it's useful, it's not complicated. Now, one thing that I liked about first edition that I didn't see as much here is regular mages see that paradox either does not affect marauders or affects them very weakly and occasionally. And so mages are always worried about paradox. How can we, you know, make that vital breakthrough in understanding or research so that we can lessen paradox or escape it entirely? And so in first edition, it was very clear that regular mages were interested in marauders because they had, marauders had something that regular mages wanted. And there was a way it's like, maybe we can get this without going crazy. And so that attracted mages to marauders. And of course, that's a dangerous attraction because they can get into a lot of, of trouble trying to be around marauders. This book didn't really make any mention of that. It doesn't give a reason why mages would seek out marauders. It's just the assumption that marauders are going to be dumped on your players and then they have to deal with it. And so uh, I was a little sad to see that left out. This book also ignores the possibility that there is an outside unified force that is manipulating marauders. It actually spells out um, in this book uh, the same thing as, as previous two editions, that every marauder has their own unique ins insanity and they're doing their own thing. And I really liked the very earliest mage books like Loom of Fate, where it hints that there's some outside force in the world or in the Umbra that is manipulating groups of marauders and sending them to do things. I thought that was an idea I might like to play with my own chronicles. And so that idea was, was specifically shut down here. Chapter 3 is entitled Infernalism and is about infernalism. The section starts with a walkthrough of every tradition's view of infernalism as well as the temptations that can cause people to give in to the dark pull of selling a part of your majorly self to some entity to gain power. For instance, they say cultists consider infernalists to be those who have eschewed responsibility. And if there's anything that second edition has established, when you think responsible, you should think cult of ecstasy. The verbena say that they view the infernalism as a cancer, but people will often give into it to get power so that they can get revenge. And revenge comes up a couple of times and once you go through all nine traditions you start seeing that it's basically variations on the same thing where it's like you know it's great power you know it's really sucks having to work for it you know it's a real easy way to get power without working for it infernalism and uh i think just kind of mentioning that would have saved a lot of words yeah they then go through whether or not each group has a particular entity within it that tries to deal with the infernal and does then repeat that for the technocracy. And I thought it was interesting in that in the technocratic group, it makes mention of the fact that once people have touched the infernal, those agents tend to be changed. So they refer to them as being part of like the infernal X-Files, which I thought was a really cool chronicle idea. The other thing it does is it gives us a peek inside technocracy justice, where someone accused of infernalism is sent to a symposium where five members um, question them until they all agree on what should happen. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We haven't really previously gotten a lot of information on what a technocratic inquest or grand jury proceeding would look like. The traditions, on the other hand, tend to prefer to handle things in-house. And it also brought up the idea that the technocracy equivalent of Gilgul is referred to as a mind wipe. And I'm like, oh, I may have seen that before, but I don't remember it. And I like that term. It talks about the four types of infernalists, that you have the demonologist who is studying demons and they seek to command rather than trade or serve them. You have infernal barter where you trade everything 
but souls. And this is generally the level at which people find out that you do it and harsh punishment starts coming down. Uh, different groups have different views of demonology and whether or not it's appropriate, but often this is kind of the first step on the road to uh, maybe getting in over your head. You have the soul trade where you trade bits of your soul. And if someone were to find out that you were doing this, you would likely be killed. And then finally you have subjugation, which is you give your entire soul away at once. And if anyone finds out that this has happened, generally the response is Gilgul. Why would you give away all your soul at once? Because that way, uh, Demon Dad likes you more. You become the favorite. You also become an NPC, but you become the favorite. Upside, upside, downside. Uh, it goes over a list of reasons, and these are generally not that interesting, like greed, lust, envy, revenge, perversion, desperation, despair, and sloth. Um, I didn't know sloths were so disposed towards giving away their souls, but hey, you do you. It also mentions that in some cases it's birthright, where a family tends to be an infernalist. I understand like what they're getting at, but part of me is like, you, you just like your family pressing you into like gaining dark access to magic because it's what their family does. Like they're not even into infernalism, but it's like, oh, it's a tradition and it keeps us together as a family. Um, sell part of your soul, just like your sister did. And it gives some recommendations for merits and flaws that should go along with that. We get a list of pledging entities. These are things that you can sell your soul to and what they generally give you in exchange. And it introduces the idea that merits and flaws that you get from selling your soul and the power that you get should in some way match up with the entity that you are uh, selling to. It brings the idea of Rex Mundi or Yaldaba Oath, another one of the names that we get for one of the Aeons or one of the entities that is involved in, uh, in Gnostic beliefs. He is the rightful uh, king of creation and is trying to enlist entities to to provide him power. The Dark Man at the Crossroads, which is more of a secular one, that we have a, that there's a trickster and he tends to help with spheres and knowledge. Loviator, the Maiden of Pain. And I thought these were good, flavorful things that you can add. It gives information on how the soul trade works. It spends a page and a half going through how you can find an entity to barter your soul to. And throughout the entire section, I'm like, wow, this sounds like trying to find drugs in the 90s, where it's like, yeah, maybe you know a guy, or you find a, a demonic store that they might be able to guide you, or like maybe you hear rumors of demonologists. I'm like, wow, this was like when I heard people talk about scoring weed in high school. It goes through the mechanics that you get soul points, which is your willpower plus your arete times 10, and you spend things on bargains, and that you can only do it so many times, but that after a certain period of time, just like vampirism, eventually you will just kind of lose your soul. But it also, in the system that it presents, says make a uh, intelligence plus law rail against difficulty eight. And if you max out those stats, on average, your character can easily become an archmage. Like if you were to be like, hey, I'm going to build the best Infernalist, there is an OP Infernalist build where you ultimately walk out the other end an Archmage and really haven't given up most of your soul. And I like when Revise tries to come up with systems and they just kind of don't make sense sometimes. They mention that you can sell your entire soul at once for a bonus, which doesn't make sense to me because if you sell your entire soul, you're effectively an NPC, so who cares? Um, is this something like where you don't tell the player ahead of time that that happens and you just take their character sheet and laugh at them because that would be like the best 1990s white wolf maneuver to make. They talk about some of the investments and the signs that, that, that this may cause. And I like the way it would be something like a benefit you can get having big horns that deal bashing damage reveal you have big horns. Like, thanks, Buck. I wouldn't have figured that one out. Um, <laughs> backgrounds are very common. Uh, the idea that you can get demonic contacts or, or demonic talismans or what have you. Ebon Fountain, I was particularly fond of, where every day you just get 10 points of quintessence at midnight. They introduce the idea of the Devil Eaten, who are characters that have been possessed by a demon uh, who didn't necessarily sell it and slowly become these demonic Cthuloid creatures and that they're slowly reshaped. And it gives the recommended advice, pick three powers, and uh, you got yourself an antagonist. I think the two things that, that were interesting to me most in this chapter were, one, it presents the idea of, okay, so a character has entered a demonic bargain. How do I get out of it? And it goes over a few options. It's like, hey, you will probably never be powerful enough to uh, defeat directly this kind of entity, but you can play a long game. And it also brings up the idea of a major seeking may undo the bargain. And I like the idea of mages having access to 
other types of seeking that allow them to make some sort of change. It, it's not fully fleshed out. And like just the idea that getting a Rite 7 and undoing a demonic bargain are both about the same level of difficulty. I don't know what that says about either. And it also talks about how, why demons want to corrupt mortals. And it says souls represent the power of humans for change and that mages are the architects of humanity's future. So mages are a larger prize in them trying to destroy things, which kind of gives a unifying idea behind the infernal and the Nefandi, which you may or may not like, um, but at least gives them kind of a motivation, which I thought was interesting. But again, it's World of Darkness, so everything comes back to humanity for reasons that are never quite fully understood. I would have liked more about cults, which we got in the first book of Madness, like the organizations around the pledging entities. But I'm going to say that this was fine. What did you think about this chapter? I thought it was very interesting that the mage game term infernalist has changed its definition here. And I like this definition more. In the first book of Madness for first edition mage, the term infernalist meant uh, someone who serves dark powers, but they are not a mage. If they were a mage, they would be a nefandus. Mm -hmm. And so this time it, it says an infernalist is anyone who is serving infernal powers. It's like, yeah, that just makes so much more sense. Thank you for changing that definition. Interesting for me, this is the first time the, the game term barabi is used for someone who's not actually a nefandus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I got to say it's, it, it's appropriate. It, it fits. When the Council of Nine calls someone uh, Barabbas, uh, you know, individual Barabbas, plural, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't have to mean in the fondness. It means someone who has turned their back on everything we believe in and is actively working against you know, the whole Council of Nine's uh, goals and philosophies. It's like, yeah, that, that, that fits. Good idea. Uh, we have this list of uh, lords or basically infernal entities that NPCs can, can serve and get their infernal powers from. And I really liked this because, like probably most people, when I hear about infernal powers, I think, oh, okay, uh, traditional Western ideas of, of devils and demons and, and like that. And this list of possible lords opens it up, says, hey, we can take the Greek god Ares and make him an infernal evil version, which you know, kind of makes sense when, when you look at some of the traditional Greek, I mean, not the later Roman, but some of the Greek material on him. It's like, yeah, I, I can sort of see this. And this, they had that Rexus Mundi or the king of the world, which when I was reading the description, I, I got an idea that this is... This is an infernal power that has much less uh, religious overtones and can fit more for someone who's sticking to more of um, what you might call an, an, an atheist mindset when they're running mage. It's like, yeah, let, let's not get into the idea that all the traditional real-world religions are absolutely right and correct. Let, let's say that they're just you know, not correct, and let's deal with uh, separate entities. It's, yeah, this king of the world could work well. You could have infernalists who are not you know, Satanists in your game. And there are other lords that are, that are also interesting. They even pulled something out of uh, Aztec religion or mythology from the past. And it's like, yeah, the, I like this new take on infernal powers that you could have active in your game. And as Terry said, it would have been really nice to see some cults or groups or societies centered around these different lords. And we didn't, didn't see that. The whole idea of having a point system and calling it soul points just really weirded me out. It's like, so... You take your willpower, multiply it by 10, and, and arate too, and, and so you get the number of soul points, and then you count off how many you trade away. And it's like, that, that just totally weirds me out. I, I don't like taking the notion of the human soul and putting it down to a point system. That's probably because I don't allow infernalist um, player characters. I say, look, infernalist, you know, you're serving demons and devils. Okay, these, these are NPCs, and, and can, we, can we just agree that they're villains? When it comes to soul points, it's like, I don't need this. I don't use this. The NPC traded away some of his soul or none of it or all of it, and that's good enough for me. I don't need points. Now, my player characters are not going to be buying infernal in, uh, investments. Those are going to be for the NPCs. So how many points they're worth after character creation? Just don't care. Uh, this book gives a big list of infernal investments, the, the evil powers that the NPCs get for trading away parts of their soul. And, and that was cool. There were a lot of interesting powers here. It was bigger than infernal investment lists I've seen in, in previous mage books. Uh, there's one in the original book of Madness, but there's, there are other mage books as well you see infernal investments. In. And I, I like this nice big list. And it's nice that my one complaint on this list of infernal investments is mask of innocence and this is a specific power it's 10 points and it basically says uh, you can cover up 
the signs and indications of all your demonic investments so it looks like you're a totally regular guy. And it's like, well, okay, that, that gets into the themes behind this that the storyteller wants to emphasize. It's like if you, you know, if the villain sells his soul out to infernal powers, then yeah, that's going to have um, side effects. But you take Mask of Innocence, and oh, there's no side effects now. It's like, okay, I'm going to have to really think through, do I want this or not? I guess it's handy to have some stealth ability for infernalists, but I'm not sure if this is quite the way I would do it. I would have liked to see more stats for evil beings. Um, and they have a big sidebar where they mention, here we have uh, low-level imps, we have medium fiends, and we have high-level lords, and they have these different powers, and these are ways you can use them in their games. Like, okay, how about stats for a typical imp and fiend and lord? That would have helped me. I think that would have been great, but it just was not here. I like the idea that they're like, should we include stats? And they're like, no, we need more space for headers and footers and salutations in the Balton Mikado section. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> we have chapter four entitled Umbrood. And how to put this? This is quite simply the most prolix section in the history of Mage. It has the highest ratio of words to usable material times how much you want that usable material. Like sometimes there are long sections that are wordy and have a few gems in them, like storytelling advice. But that's the stuff that I never have to go back to. This would be the equivalent of if the descriptions for what counted as alertness and awareness, which a lot of people are like, oh wait, which one's which, were immersed in a 4,000 word New Yorker article. And only by reading the entirety of it could you find the difference between the two. This is remarkably wordy. It's so wordy, I am getting wordy trying to describe how wordy it is. This is a, a correspondence between uh, a technocrat and another mage, and they're talking about their experiences in the Umbrood, and they are constantly talking about, thank you for your previous message. I very much enjoyed your roast, your recipe for roast ham. And like, I may have enjoyed it more if it included more non sequiturs. It's across a number of pages, and it touches on a number of topics involving the Umbrood and the Umbral realms, and it doesn't really say a lot. It goes over the type of entities they encounter, the Celestines and the Incarna, who are essentially gods that can be theoretically weakened by shifting mortal belief, the idea of ghosts, that there are realm creatures that inhabit these pocket areas in the Umbra, demons, which they describe as demons, paradox spirits, which they call reality's antibodies, bygones, which they call minions of stronger creatures, which to me is a redefinition of historically what a bygone is, which was formerly a, uh, a material creature that was still in the material world that, that was some sort of mythic archetype, whether it be a unicorn or a rock or something. And then the abstractions, which fit no other category, they give us a new interpretation of the high umbral classifications, where previously we had Lord and Preceptor and so on. It gives us the uh, the divinities, the avatars, the sovereigns, the major domo and the subordinates. And they just kind of retitle things and they don't give us really examples or way of using things. Yeah, when I was looking through this, it was it was interesting that they have re retitled the ranks of Umbrood. Uh, like divinity in this book is Celestine in the first two editions of Mage. An avatar in this book, not to be confused with mage avatars, thank you very much. Um, the avatar in this book is the Incarna of the first two editions, and the Sovereign of this book is the Lord of the first two editions, and the Major Domo of this book is the Preceptor of the High Umbra, Jaggling of the Middle Umbra of the first two editions. Subordinate in this book is the Minion in the first two editions, which is High Umbra, and the Gaffling, which is Middle Umbra. And so it gets it's the relabeling there, but not a, a big actual change. We get the idea of the Court of Shadows. In the previous editions of Mage, we got the idea that the Umbral Courts may or may not be a single entity, uh, that there was the Eastern Court, the Western Court, and the Egyptian Court, and we didn't get a huge amount about its th their necessary goings-on, that entities within it battle to rise, that the old entities that have been there and have amassed political power go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other entities who have gained power due to their ascendance as a concept. And I kind of like that and would have liked a lot more information on how the old experienced wheeler dealers deal with rising concepts in the Umbra and that, that there may be just a single court that changes appearance over time. We got the idea that there are two branches that Umbrood have two roles that they fulfill at the same time 
One is kind of a conceptual branch that does not change too much, that if you represent a powerful idea that you could be very powerful in this one branch, where the other one is more managerial or technocratic, where you could be an accountant or something like that, and that is where the uh, politicking comes in. And I just needed more information for that set up to make sense. I did like the idea that Umbrood have this thing that they're jockeying in and this other thing that they're worrying about, but it also doesn't really give us information on what the Umbrood do. Like it talks about politicking and what their powers are, kind of, but it doesn't talk about how um, the preceptor of the color blue is interested in making the world more filled with the color blue. We just don't really get that, or at least it did not come out clearly to me what kind of changes the Umbrood were trying to make in the world and how they went about doing that, which to me as a mage storyteller, I want to know. Do they send entities into the penumbra uh, to inspire mortals? Do they get work through other agents? Do they cut contracts with other creatures? It talks about how the Umbre may overlap and that where the High Umbra and Low Umbra overlap, that is the realm of forgotten inventions and lost novels, and that the Low Umbra plus the Middle Umbra is full of ghosts. And I'm like, what? It introduces the idea that spirits can move between the levels of the Umbre, so take that, Wraith, and that there are these free spirits that seem to be doing their own thing that may be snags in the tapestry. They may occur when reality destabilizes or an Umbral entity is given direct power by its lord, and then it gives us some information on how to actually use them, that they could be messengers, that there may be this network of Umbrood that run around delivering things that players can interact with or get the wrong message, or their information can be stolen by someone else, that they can be allies, that the Umbrood want assistance in the form of quintessence, access, or maybe other things. Or they could be enemies. And this is an interesting one because it talks about how the Umbrood recognize that mages adjust reality and that Umbrood may notice that. They could declare war on mages that they may ultimately oppose in the future, which I thought was an interesting idea, that you have this kind of preemptive war waged against a group, either because an Umbrood thinks a mage is going to interfere, or because they are a Umbrood that has the ability to see into the future and sees that they will eventually come into conflict. We get a few examples. Uh, sunset Violet, for instance, is the uh, spirit that represents the color, more or less, of a sunset, and can make people feel all all nice and happy and they have john henry uh the the character from uh, folklore and that his form of the blast charm takes place in the form of uh throwing a big old hammer and i'm like well that's that's okay overall i found that this chapter did make the umbrood a little bit more strange than previous editions which i liked but it just didn't give me enough to work with like there was a lot of hand waving and i would not feel comfortable handing this book to a storyteller and being like Go Umbra! It, I thought it was confused, it was mixed up, and it had a poor sense of direction. Uh, for starters, there were editing problems. I mean, a number of editing problems as I was running through, like an extra word or a word taken out yeah. or a funny misspelling, and it's yeah. like... Yeah, this 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 chapter needed another pass by the editors, and I totally agree with you about the, the this this chapter was way too wordy. The in character fiction was letters back and forth, and so it's like you're trying to read something about how the umbra is structured or what this umbrood does, and it says, "Oh, thank you so much for your last letter. You're so witty. You're so brilliant. I'm so glad I get letters from you." I'm like, just get to the point, please. Mm -hmm. I, this point was driven home for me this week. I was uh, I noticed in my own personal notes I didn't have any information on the factions of the progenitors. And so I was like, okay, let's grab that first progenitor book and make sure I've got my ducks in a row. And I went to the section talking about factions within the progenitors. And it's, it's this in-character account of this guy who's having a rough week. And it's like, I don't care. Just give me the information. I had to read this... You know, pages and pages really carefully and then think about it and, and tease the information out of it. And it's like, yeah... If in the future, if I want to get the information on the Umbrood in, in any quick manner from this chapter, I, I'm going to be pulling my hair out. It's just not going to be fun. So this chapter claims that it is about the Umbrood, the, the beings that one finds in the Umbra or that leave the Umbra and come to Earth and cause trouble. Uh, it, this chapter spends a lot of time talking about the structure of the Umbra and how to travel around in the Umbra and what the two correspondence, uh, sending letters back and forth to each other, think of the Umbra, and it's like, no, you need to stay on topic. S the topic is beings in the Umbra or from the Umbra. Why are you giving me so much information about umbral structure and umbral travel when Revised Edition has made it very clear 
that uh, this is a game that focuses on what mages are doing on Earth. This is not a game that focuses on mages going into the Umbra or postulating on the structure of the Umbra. So we, we are getting way off theme, way off track, way off topic. I was disappointed that there was so little information on Umbrood that come from the Umbra to Earth and cause trouble, either as materialized spirits or as invisible spirits. There's like one sentence where they mention that this happens, and then they carry on. It's like, wow, okay, you, you guys should have focused on this topic. What kinds of Umbrood come to Earth? What are their general you know, justifications for making the trip? Uh, how do different mage factions on Earth deal with these Umbrood that come over to Earth and, and stir things up? I think that would have been an appropriate focus for a revised edition chapter that claims it's talking all about Umbrood. What I couldn't understand is why do we have these two older, more powerful, high-level mages in the world of darkness who have this goal of telling sleepers, regular people on Earth who are not mages, all about the Umbra and the Umbrood? It's like, why do they want to do this? How does this benefit them? How do they think they're going to keep this information from uh, being suppressed or even get people to believe it? It's like, I, I just don't understand why they have this goal and what they're going to get out of it. I thought the new ranks for the Umbrood were, were kind of dull. I mean, they, they kind of take the, the fun out of it. The, the older rank names from the first two editions of Mage for Umbrood, they were somehow more creative, more evocative. It kind of got my imagination going a little better. I really liked the section that was titled As Enemies, using Umbrood as enemies. It talks about how you can have Umbrood who uh, get bored, and so they choose a mage to start messing with and how they might have a really good reason for it or they might not have a good reason for it and it, it gets into a little bit of detail of what they might do and how a mage might deal with it and and prevent it or even uh, turn the umbrood to uh, you know bothering someone else i thought that was really cool i really like that idea of because you're a mage because you are living a different life than you did before you awakened you are now uh, visible to umbrood who might come down and mess with you and there's no dramatic big story reason for it they're just messing with you, and you just got to deal with it. I, mm -hmm. I thought that was really fun. can add a lot of spice to game sessions. I thought the information about how the shadow court in the High Umbra works, you know, the specifics about ranks and things they do, I thought that kind of took the fun out of it. I, I always thought that umbral courts, whether there's one or many, they're supposed to be real darn mysterious and arcane and... and uh, you know, just very difficult to figure out. And uh, even on their best, if you get a hermetic who knows all about it, there's only so much they can tell you. A lot of it is still left in mystery. And so to have it all laid out neatly for me, it's like, well, I guess I can see how a storyteller could benefit from this. But I think taking the mystique out of it, it does it an injustice. At the end, they have a section on how you can take um, umbrewed uh, stats in, the, in previous uh, mage books and randomize them. I kind of like the idea, but it's... You know, kind of complex and time-consuming. It's this great big chart that you roll on and have to check. You know, it's easier to just look at one of the stats and say, "I'm, I'm going to take put this down one or put it up two. It's just so much faster for a storyteller. Why not just do that? Even across revised, we get introduced to a whole bunch of umbral courts. Uh, Blood treachery introduced the zodiacal court, for instance, and then yeah, that was cool. Like, there, yeah, there's an eastern and a western court. I'm like, okay, so does that mean that everyone's part of the Eastern and the Western court, and these are blocks. It's just not explained. From my reading of it, I, I, I got the impression that the authors were trying to tell us that some mages think there is a lodge in the sky and an Egyptian court and an Eastern court and a Western court, and they interact with each other. But these two older, more powerful mages have discovered that there was always only one called the Shadow Court. And some people, when they see it, they see you know, Egyptian trappings, and they think, oh, this must be the Egyptian court. And, uh, and other you know, mages from China, they see them in traditional Chinese robes, and they think, oh, this must be the Eastern court, when it was always just one court that took on different appearances to different observers. And it's like, uh, okay, I, I guess that could be an interesting idea. Finally, Chapter 5 is entitled Storytelling, and gives some recommendations on storytelling. I think a lot of the advice in this chapter is kind of mediocre but there are some good points one of the recommendations it does is when dealing with something like the marauders or the nefandi it is very easy to overwhelm players and it is very easy for it to become stupid when you look at it kind of in the full light of day so the recommendation is hint at things you don't need to show graphic violence to unsettle people you don't need to dip your players neck deep in the madness of a marauder to give off the idea that they are disturbed or they're 
there's something slightly off about them. And it recommends that one should uh, kind of key in on what the emotions they would like to have tied to a uh, another entity in the game are. For instance, it says, uh, Marauders aren't understood. Many editions have made the Marauders entirely understandable, and that the Marauders kind of represent what happens if you go too far as an entity of dynamism. So it presents both a warning and a opportunity for introspection, uh, where for the Nefande they say people have their reasons and other people don't and are just kind of born bad. I thought a lot of the advice was kind of bad. I don't use red herrings. Players introduce their own red herrings. Like, it's unless you're doing an intense amount of gaming and you have players that have a remarkably high bar for being frustrated, the idea of introducing any sort of non-obvious misdirection I think is just cruel and can result in everyone getting frustrated. The idea that uh, villains uh, should be sympathetic. I, I don't know why we keep bringing this up. I, I think it can be useful or that should have their reasons. But like if we look at human history, there are a lot of absolutely despicable people that have no reason why they were despicable. They just turned out to be despicable people. It talks about the different groups as anti-heroes. And I'm like, no, that's not really the, the interpretation that we have now. I, I didn't get the sense that the people who wrote this advice had run a lot of games for people who were not already committed to mage and for role-playing. These are things that I think in a lot of cases you can get away with. It has a whole thing on avoiding stereotypes, but like the previous two chapters are kind of on setting up the stereotypes of what you should expect from a Nefondus and what you should expect from a Marauder. Like, if you get a Marauder that doesn't seem that insane or a Nefondus that doesn't seem that evil, then I don't think you've used a Marauder or a Nefondus. Sure, if it's the third one you introduce, there should be some variety to it, or if you need to change it to fit your story. But there are cases where you do want nuance and cases where you don't. So I, I simply disagree with a lot of it. And at the same time, it was also somewhat wordy. It also presented a lot on the portrayal of mental illness and I think it is perfectly possible to introduce the Marauders without having them just be a commentary on the perception of mental illness. Like, that to me is doing them a, a wide disservice. That can factor into it, but there are a lot of different directions. And, and likewise, uh, the Nefandi can be more than just a, a meditation on the nature of evil. They can also be very dynamic entities that happen to be opposing your characters. Not everything in the game gets to be reduced to a, to a single metaphor or synecdoche. It's funny how Terry and I have different uh, points of view on, on many topics, but uh, on, on this one, I, I, <laughs> a lot to agree with. This chapter said a lot about how um, you need to make your villains detailed and relatable because relatable, understandable villains are that much more terrifying. And I thought, well, you know, the, the, I guess they can be, but not necessarily. I think sometimes the unknown is is pretty scary for people too. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm fine with a villain who's... You know, this ancient Nefondus who's covered up his past and you can't research his past. And so I, I think that can be, on a certain level, scary and, and fun in a game. I also think that uh, I, I kind of did like the uh, one paragraph they had of advice on um, uh, make your villains uh, powerful, but give them weaknesses. And the players uh, learn those weaknesses only if they do their homework, if they talk to people who have encountered this villain in the past or the villain's family or, or minions or whatever and find out about the villains. Oh, he's got this weak point. Now we can take him down. It's like, yeah, I, I think for some villains, that's a good approach. And so I, I kind of like that. This chapter was full of things that I thought were, were good ideas and, and even more things I thought were, were bad ideas where I was wondering, well, why is this even here? Like, they talk about marauders, and it's like, we had a chapter on marauders. It would have been a great place to talk about marauders. But anyways, we've got this whole section on, um, as a storyteller, how do you deal with marauders? And it says, you've got to emphasize these two things. Becoming a marauder can happen to any mage. And it's like, well, that's an assumption I don't make. And um, marauder insanity is, is basically a commentary on sleeper insanity and how insanity is treated in our real world today. And it's like, I, I, I don't make that connection. I don't make that assumption. Um, there's all this advice on how to make marauders parallel real-world insanities, and I thought, you know, I, I think it's compelling to me as a mage fan and, and also, I think, potentially interesting to players to say that, hey, uh, marauder insanity is something different. Mm -hmm. You can't just read case files about real-world sleeper insanity and say, okay, now now I've got a handle on marauders. So, the marauders are influenced by this mysterious force, and they are something different, and um, I, I like the idea of... of playing with that idea as a storyteller and, and having my players discover something new and different. 
And it's one of those things where like, I think we should have a healthy discourse and a healthy set of tools to show mages with mental illness. Like when I think of the power that a mage can accumulate, it makes sense to me that you can have some sort of magical version of OCD. That to me is where that DSM stuff comes into play, where characters can have it develop as an obsession or a paradox backlash or something like that. And that's where I want it. I don't want to just shove it into the marauders. And I would love information on how to do that. We just don't get it. Sorry for interrupting, but. Yeah, um, I heard a uh, uh, interview not too long ago with a line developer for Mage 20 and, um, this person was saying uh, there is not going to be a Mage 20 supplement on Marauders because uh, insanity is is a, a very real thing and we should be sensitive to that and we should not make light of it. And I was listening to this like, okay, I agree, insanity is a real thing. We should have sympathy. We should not make light of it in our role-playing games. But the Marauders are not necessarily regular real-world insanity. There's something magical and different, and we can have a supplement on that without making some sort of uh, bad commentary on real-world insane asylums. So, yeah, I think we're limiting ourselves too much. We should be sensitive, but we should be sensitive in a, in a practical, helpful way. And it's also one of those things where we could have the opportunity to kind of change what the group represents. Like, if they are all of dynamism, that doesn't necessarily have to be strictly madness. Like, off to one end, that can be that. Kind of like even within the Fondi, you have the uh, Kalasha who have just completely given themselves over and they're the least relatable. I would love to see that same kind of spectrum on the Marauder side, that maybe there are multiple dynamic factions. I think there is a lot of space, a lot of pasture, whatever metaphor you want to use, that can be explored that, as Adam says, is not strictly a, a meditation on how our society treats mental illness. It can be in there, but that doesn't need to be the entirety of it. They had one uh, small section talking about how you can teach your players about some of the realities of violence through NPCs. And I thought, okay, that is actually a clever idea. Because uh, you want to have, you know, car chases and gunfights and stuff in your game. Sometimes it's fun to have some of that, you know, action movie influence in your game. But at the same time, you want your players to have... You st- you want them to interact in a believable manner with your mage world. You don't want them to pull out the oversized, um, you know, super sword and try to hack off the head of every single villain they meet because they's bad guys. You know, that that's getting a little cartoony. Mm-hmm. And so you want combat to be something that your players think twice about. It's like, whoa, I, I might get shot. That That's pretty bad. And so if you have your characters get hurt and then you have this long, drawn-out game session of, yeah, you're in a hospital bed and it sucks... Did you know that the there's all this stuff going on and you can't do it because you've got a broken leg? Yeah, that's life. That's reality. That would be a pretty sucky game session. But when you have your players get to know an NPC, um, some sleeper supporting NPC who's like, I don't know, relative, uh, friend, coffee shop owner, whatever, and the villains show up and injure that NPC, and then the characters go and visit them in the hospital and, and see how you know how awful their injuries are. And it's like, okay, this is this is a, a little more subtle way of saying to your players, hey, if you jump into combat, you might get hurt, and that would be, really suck. But I'm not gonna drag you through that in a drawn out game session. It's like that makes sense to me. I, I like that idea. Let's make violence look awful without hitting our players over the head with it. They have a section on anti heroes, and they say the anti hero is the guy who's uh, you know making mistakes and working towards bad but he's relatable and you're, you're kind of rooting for him despite that fact and then it says on page 147 Nefandi make great anti-heroes I'm like huh wait what <laughs> yep. you said in this chapter that Nefandi are completely evil and horrible and they make great anti-heroes I can't see this this does not make sense to me so what did you think overall about the book Overall, when I look at the first book of Mandis, they had a chapter on paradox, and uh, I thought that was it was interesting. I really liked that chapter. This book, that chapter is taken out. Yet I'm not going to complain because I think that is appropriate. Revised edition uh, likes to do things a little differently. In, in first edition, mage, all the mages were researching paradox and trying to find the secret that would help them escape paradox or use it, you know, in their favor. And paradox was a sort of mystical cosmic thing that can do really strange things to you. In revised edition, paradox is more simple, direct. Uh, it injures you, and so you avoid it because it will, you don't want to be injured, and you don't want your magical rote to be shut down. You want it to be successful. And so it, it's a more practical, real-world approach to paradox. And so it, it fits that there's no chapter on it here, because I think if it was here, it, it would not work very well in revised edition. So I, I agree with that decision on the part of the, the people putting together this book. Yeah, that sums up my, my general thoughts on the book. Yeah, to me, there were three key takes from this. One, it gives you the revised version of things, where it says, hey, this is the current state of the Nefandi. There's a lot of abandoned labyrinths. 
really cool story idea. They're, uh, they've descended into internal infighting because of maybe losing access to their masters. Cool. They're scrambling to figure out what this new world is like. Awesome. Also, uh, there's a bunch of them that disappeared in 1945, so they could still be out there. Neat idea. But the rest of that section was just kind of uh, uh, mediocre and maybe did a worse job than the previous Book of Madness. So it gives you the revised take on things. Two, it gives us a complete overhaul of what it is like to interact with a marauder and how they work. And that chef's kiss, beautiful. Glad to see that in there. Uh, Definitely. And then there are a few interesting ideas. I didn't find anything earth shattering in the Umbra section. It was almost like first edition early first edition in terms of the amount of information that it gave you and it makes the umbra wild and uh and weird again but in a remarkably boring way and there were a few interesting story ideas and so on in there so if you really want updated marauder information and are just kind of curious about another take on everything i think it is is worth your time but otherwise if someone were to say hey i have the first book of madness do i need to get the second or i have the m20 core Uh, Do I need to get this? I would probably go, nah, unless you're a completist. We read them, so you don't have to, which is not technically true because we hope that you read them um, as well. But still, (laughs) on the criticism side, the biggest enemy in this book was internal consistency and editing. uh, Oh, yeah. The the storyteller advice didn't line up with the information that was being given in the, the antagonist chapters, like how marauders were presented at the end and how marauders were presented in the marauder section weren't quite the same. Likewise with Nefandi, Adam's point regarding, like, they make great antiheroes. No. (laughs) (laughs) and and that was just kind of frustrating we mentioned the thing about the Gelidians uh, not quite lining up and just all of those things give you the feeling like the book wasn't completely polished or people didn't really care about it and at least to me as a reader that gets to me if it doesn't feel like the author is super invested in it then that, that becomes something that I find a bit of a drag but, uh, yeah, the, the Nefandi chapter, it's like it's like they phoned it in. It's like, let's look at some past notes. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, okay. We're done. Hey, yeah. let's move on to something more interesting. Yeah. Those are my thoughts. W- what do we get to read next, Adam? Tradition book, Cult of Ecstasy Revised. Our favorite fun-loving mages who are, by the way, very, very responsible, as you should be too, but still be fun and experiment. While we have the list up, if you are curious about more information about what the, the Umbra looks like, that is a mere uh, 10 books from now in Infinite Tapestry. So one every two weeks. So in another four months, you will have the information <laughs> you need to run an yeah. Umbra Chronicle. Well, this book had a quote that uh, I, I usually don't find a favorite quote in the book, but this one just stood out to me. When concepts go to war, everybody loses. I was like, well, uh, yeah, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> Which is odd because that's kind of like what mage is and also to a certain extent what werewolf is. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the ones that I liked were uh, one was uh, the the section of stereotypes where it was Nefandi about the technocracy. The technocracy want to remake the universe in the image of their master. We want to make, remake the universe in the image of our masters. Whose do you think are stronger? I'm going to say the technocracy actually at the end of the day, but I don't think that's what they were getting at. I'm like, I think the spirit of human progress is going to ultimately be more powerful than Cthulhu, but that's just me. And then there's the section in the Baltimacado section where they're going back and forth about uh, someone being stuck in a number realm. And you must know that my existence has long since been my own. I don't know if that actually meant anything or if it was poor editing, but anyway, I am kept alive because I remain the symbol from a hazy dream, the specifics of which are long forgotten. I am nostalgia that draws breath. On the most superficial of levels, I provide melancholy to those who have willingly plucked out their own eyes. They act as though my presence allows them to recall the memory of color. And I'm like, huh. Part of that was, oh man, this is the part where they tell us what it is like to be disembodied. Like, I, I thought that's what was in this section, and then it wasn't, which I think is kind of a good summary of this book. Like, oh, man, I think they're <laughs> going to do blood. Oh, no, that's that's a different book. And with that, do you want to take us out? If you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review for Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in their searches, and we would appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. This episode is thanks to executive producers John Magnuson, Ira Grace, Richard Bat Brewster, Michael Parker, Christopher Phillips, Lara J. Sunsern, Bryce Perry, William Martin, John Horton, William Connolly, Brendan Morrill, Andrew Katz, Jenna F., Andrew Edelstein, Chris Sack, Anders, and Justin. If you would like to become an executive producer for Mage the Podcast, it would help us keep producing episodes like this one. 
You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening to us today. Hopefully we gave you something useful for your own games. And until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Go use the Marauder as a representation of insanity and how we treat mental illness in modern society, but also consider that they can be used in other ways that are also enriching to your stories. Bye.